Hello and welcome to the Women's Weekly Bible Challenge. I'm Lisa Ann Spencer. Today I am participating in a collaboration hosted by Natasha at Little Bits of Bliss. Her channel will be linked below as will the playlist of all the other people who are participating in this collaboration. The topic seems to be um, Bible-based, um, what each of us have learned from our study of the Bible. So I cannot um, advise you on what the others will be talking about today other than to tell you just check out the playlist for yourself. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about myself for those of you who may be new to my channel. Um, by participating in this collaboration. I am a wife of 32 years and my husband and I have six children. I have homeschooled those children throughout their school years. Uh, the, the oldest four have graduated and I still have two, two that are in high school and middle school. <clears throat> um, I had assurance of salvation um, about 24 years ago. I thought before that that I was saved because I had attended a little Bible Baptist church and um, walked down the aisle because I had been convicted that I was a sinner. So I responded to the call, walked down the aisle, said a prayer, and that evening was water baptized. But if I had died, um, after that, I would have gone to hell because I did not trust in the only thing that can save us from the penalty of our sins, and that is the blood of Christ shed on the cross. Um, that is what um, paid our debt, and when I trusted in that, which did not happen until many years later, it didn't happen until many years later because I never heard the truth of the gospel clearly spoken. And if I ever did hear it, the gospel, how that Jesus Christ died and that he was buried and he rose again the third day and that if I put my trust in his payment, then I would be saved. His death made me righteous. So I understood that about 24 years ago and um, Ever since then, I've been learning more and more about the scripture. I've been a student of the Bible for the last 24 years, and I continue to grow and learn as I continue to study the Bible. So I always want to be sure to give a very clear gospel presentation because there are things that people think save them, but they don't. Uh, saying a prayer cannot save you. Walking down an aisle and joining a church cannot save you. Getting baptized in a tank of water has no ability to save you, only by putting your trust in what Christ has done on the cross. That is what saves you. So once you're saved, then you begin this journey of reading and studying God's Word and then growing, strengthening your inner man, the spiritual man on the inside. Um, that is the one that's important. So I also want to mention here that I host a blog. It's called the um, Women's Weekly Bible Challenge dot com. I'll pop it right down here and also a link in the description box for any of you who would like to pop over there and read some of my Bible studies. Also on YouTube, I do Bible studies as well as doing kitchen things and garden things. So if you're interested in that, be sure to stop by and subscribe if you're interested in seeing more of those types of videos. All right, so my topic for today is things that I have learned that help me to understand my Bible. There were many years as a Christian that I was confused. Um, denominationalism is a real thing. It's out there and everybody has their own take on scripture. And everybody's using a different version of the Bible too. And what that leads to is confusion. So one of the first things that really helped me to grow is to know that I could trust my King James Bible. It has stood the test of time 
It was translated from the uncorrupted Greek manuscripts, and yes, there are Greek manuscripts out there that are corrupt. So I would encourage you to spend some time studying that issue for yourself. Um, I didn't consider it at all for many years. I just thought, like many others, that the King James Bible had a bunch of these and thous, and it's archaic, and the modern versions just take those out, and they don't change, you know, the doctrinal things. And I learned that that's a lie, and now I can pick up Bibles, and I can do comparisons for myself, and I can see the error and the corruption. But when I came to trust my King James Bible, that I was trusting in the Word of God. That's what was happening. Before, I was just um, trusting in the message of the Bible, that it's all just the same and says basically the same thing. But I understand now that those things are lies. One of the things about your King James Bible is it has a built-in cross-referencing system. So, for example, like in Genesis um, 1 and 2, 1, 1 and 1, 2, where it says the earth was formless and void. There's only one other place in your Bible that says that, and that's in Jeremiah chapter 4, I believe, and you can cross-reference those things. The entire King James Bible is like that, and when the modern versions change certain words, they break that cross-referencing system that God has built into it to help us learn. So you will miss tools that you need to be able to do those cross-references and understand your Bible. And also, um, the King James Bible has its own built-in dictionary. Certain verses will define the words for you. We tend to try to grasp um, modern definitions, but we need to use biblical definitions, and that will help you understand your Bible. All right, another thing is to believe the actual words on the page, and I do want to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. So let me turn there really quickly and say that I hope that you will grab your Bible and look these verses up. If you don't have your Bible with you right now, then um, just jot these down and read them for yourself later. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Paul says to the Thessalonians, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So the key to understanding your Bible is to believe the actual words on the page. And I have a couple of examples. I didn't write these down, but there's a place in the Bible where um, <clears throat> Paul says, Last of all, he, Christ, was seen of me. If we believe that, then we can understand that the last book of the Bible written was Second Timothy. It was not the book of Revelation. John wrote Revelation much earlier, perhaps even before Paul was saved. So when the Bible says, last of all, he was seen of me, if you'll believe that, it'll increase your understanding. Also, Paul said to Timothy, consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. So if we believe that, we will consider Paul's words, and when we consider the revelation that God gave to Paul, that will um, um, give us learning in all things. And that's a true statement. Believe the words on the page. Another thing is study the Bible God's way. He actually tells us in his word how to study. So if you'll turn again to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Now, if you have a modern Bible, your Bible is not going to say this. Let me read it to you. Study to show thyself approved unto God. He tells us why to study, to show ourselves approved to God. A workman 
it's going to require work that needeth not to be ashamed. If you don't do this, you're going to be ashamed. You're not going to understand what God has for you. Rightly dividing the word of truth. So there he tells us how to study. Rightly dividing. So the word of truth is all the Bible. And how do you rightly divide the Bible? Well, you have to divide it, obviously. Some things in here are written directly to you, and some things are not. All the Bible is written for us, for our learning, but all the Bible is not written directly to us. So I do want to give you a couple of examples um, in that of ways to divide the scripture. But before I do that, I want to mention again, the modern translations, some say, do your best. Nowhere in scripture does it say, do your best. God doesn't say, do your best, because your best is never good enough. Some modern versions say, correctly handled. Not even in the Greek is correctly handled in this passage. Believe the words on the page, read the verse in your King James Bible, and then do that. And by studying it God's way, he will open your understanding. So most people realize the main division they call in the Bible the Old Testament and New Testament. And that is correct. God uses that terminology himself. But people make the mistake of thinking that the Old Testament begins in Genesis and the New Testament begins in Matthew chapter 1. Um, the Bible says, and I don't have this reference written, so I'm going to go back and edit and pop it up here. And this is going to tell you this from Hebrews that says there can't be a testament without the shedding of blood. So the Old Testament does not begin until the book of Exodus when Moses sprinkles blood on the people and on the book. That's the Old Testament. And it was for the nation of Israel. There were no Gentiles in the picture. God had selected the nation of Israel to be a people above all the people on the earth. So the Old Testament was for Israel. The New Testament does not begin until the end of the four Gospels when it said Jesus died. He gave up the ghost. He shed his blood. That's the blood of the New Testament. That New Testament was also for the same people who he shed for the Old Testament. But Paul tells us that we also are under the New Testament. And the reason we are is because we are bought by the blood of Christ. So that's one division in your scripture. But another is between prophecy and mystery. And this is the one that most people overlook. So turn in your Bible to the book of Acts chapter 3 I believe the book of Acts chapter 3 and early Acts God is still ministering only to the Jews it's a Jewish feast day if there's Gentiles there they are proselytes they have converted to Judaism they are keeping this feast of the Jews and over and over again Peter addresses men of Israel. If you'll look in chapter 2, verse 14, Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and ye that dwell at Jerusalem. That's Jews. Verse 22, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Um, verse 36, Let all the house of Israel know all right, over and over again, he is saying, um, he's speaking to Israel. He's not speaking to Gentiles. And if he is, they're Gentiles who were converted to Judaism. That kingdom is being offered to Israel. And in fact, he says so explicitly, Acts chapter 3, verse 19, Repent ye. The ye is plural. That's why ye is important. It doesn't say repent you. In our modern um, languages, you is plural. But in the King James, ye, you can be plural or singular. In the King James, ye is only plural. 
ye, the nation of Israel, repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Israel's sins are not wiped out until Jesus' second advent, till he returns and sets up that kingdom on earth. Verse 20, And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, Israel, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Now, there's a lot in that. But Peter is saying to them, you repent of killing your Messiah. Um, be converted. Be baptized in water. And God is going to send Jesus back to you, and he's going to set up that kingdom. All right, so we know a few people believed, a few thousand. But you continue reading, and you see that Israel rejects this offer of the kingdom. They don't want the risen Jesus as their Messiah. They want to be in control. So a thing to notice here is it says that Jesus um, is seated at the right hand of the Father. He it says the heaven must receive Jesus, and that's where Jesus is right now until the times of restitution when Jesus would come back. Well, something happened in Acts chapter 9, and that is Jesus came back. Um, it was a mystery. It was not spoken of by the prophets. He came and appeared to Paul. This is the mystery. So, Keep a hand in Acts chapter 3 and then flip over to Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16 and verse 25. This is Paul speaking and he says, Now to him that is of power to establish you, you Romans, you Gentiles, according to my gospel. Paul has a particular gospel that was given to him alone and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. This is not prophecy. This is mystery. And he says, which was kept secret since the world began. Compare that to Acts chapter 3, 21 that we just read. Spoken by the mouth of all the prophets since the world began. Paul is preaching something that was kept secret since the world began. That is a big division in your Bible, prophecy and mystery that most people miss because they don't believe the exact words of their Bible. I also want to show you there are different Gospels in the Bible, and this throws people for a loop. They can't hardly bear it, but the Word of God says so, and so we should believe it. Galatians chapter 2, verses 7 through 9, and you could flip over to Acts chapter 15 and put your hand there if you want to. These two chapters are talking about the same thing. It's good to study both of these side by side. Galatians chapter 2 verse 7, but contrary wise when they saw the they is the 12 apostles in Jerusalem, Peter, James, John, and the rest plus the other disciples. When they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. Verse 8 is a parenthesis, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, <coughs> excuse me, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. Two separate gospels. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen, that's the Gentile, and they unto the circumcision, that's the Jews. The twelve apostles loosed themselves from the Great Commission because something had changed. They realized that in Acts chapter 15. And that's why you see in the book of Acts, it switches from Peter over to Paul the 
gospel of the uncircumcision is fading and Paul's gospel to the circumcision is the gospel that we are under to this very day. 2,000 years of God's grace saving people by faith alone in Christ alone. So I want to... um, I would like to point out that there's different baptisms. That also freaks people out because when people read baptism, they say water. There's 14 distinct baptisms in the scripture. There's three baptisms in one verse in Luke, I believe it is. I'm going to link a PDF in the description box below that has the 14 different baptisms and all the scripture references. If you want your mind blown, go read and study that list. We know from the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19, and Mark 16, 16, that Jesus Christ sent the 12 Jewish apostles to water baptize in his name. We can do a simple comparison in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 17, Paul says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. In the Great Commission, you couldn't preach the gospel without water baptizing. Paul's gospel, you can't preach baptism with the gospel. They are two distinct things. None of the 12 apostles could say, Christ sent me not to baptize. All right, just an easy comparison, and if you'll just believe the words on the page. All scripture is written for our learning, but it is not all addressed to us. We live under the dispensation of the grace of God that was given to the Apostle Paul for us Gentiles. You can read that for yourself by reading Ephesians chapter 3. Um, But um, all the Bible is for our learning. So um, just for example, the book of Hebrews, um, it says, some Bibles say, the epistle to the Hebrews. Are you a Hebrew? I'm not a Hebrew. I'm a Gentile. That letter is not written to me. It's written to Jews who are going to be facing the great tribulation. If you know that, you can read it, learn a lot, but don't try to apply it to yourself because it's going to confuse your doctrine. All right, how about the book of James right after Hebrews? James chapter 1 verse 1. People get really confused by reading James and trying to apply it to themselves. James 1, verse 1. James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Which tribe do you belong to? None. There are no twelve tribes in the body of Christ. In the body of Christ there is no Jew and no Greek. That letter is not written to us. We can read it, we can learn from it, but do not apply it to yourself. It will cause confusion. Paul's letters are the books of Romans through Philemon. He is written, he has written to us in this dispensation today. And if you'll notice, the first word in every one of those 13 letters is his name, Paul. And he said in Thessalonians that... Um, I, I will write a salutation. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 17, Paul says, The salutation, that's a greeting of Paul, that's his name, with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. Paul said, you're going to know these are my letters because they're going to begin with my name, and he wrote them in his own hand. If you read chapter 1 of, um, no, chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians, you'll understand why Paul said that, because verse 2 says, Be not soon, excuse me, shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter, as from us. Before the Bible was even completed, men were corrupting the Word of God, and they are doing the same thing today. It's important for you to not have the counterfeit, but to have the words of God. Okay, let's see. All right, Paul is the only person to speak of the body of Christ. 
Paul is the only person to speak of the Gentiles being blessed through the fall of Israel. In the book of Isaiah, we're told in chapter 60 that is God will shine on Israel, Israel will rise, and the Gentiles will come to Israel's light. All the Old Testament speaks of the Gentiles being blessed through Israel. Romans 11, chapter 11, we are told that the Gentiles are blessed and saved and have salvation through Israel's fall. Those things are very, very different. All right, so a quick overview to end. God promised a kingdom to Israel, a king that would sit on a throne in Jerusalem, a land, a great nation. He gave them all those promises. He sent them their Messiah. They murdered him. That's not when God cut them off. Jesus rose. Jesus poured, God poured out the Holy Spirit on the nation of Israel. They prophesied and said, repent so that the kingdom will come to you. They continued to reject the risen Lord and Savior. And it's there where we see at the stoning of Stephen, a man who was full of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost was literally speaking through Stephen to the nation of Israel. They murdered Stephen. They blasphemed the Holy Ghost. And that is when God cut them off. That was in Acts chapter 7. In Acts chapter 9, you see God turning to Paul. And then the transition begins to the body of Christ, which is where we are today, the dispensation of grace. This dispensation ends with the rapture, where we meet the Lord in the air. Paul is the only person to speak of the body of Christ being raptured and meeting him in the air. God is not returning at this point to the earth. He meets us in the air. Our inheritance is in heaven. As it says in Ephesians 1, we have inherited heavenly places. Uh, Colossians 3, set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. That's just the opposite of what he told Israel. You're going to have an earthly kingdom. That wasn't, it's not an allegory. It is a true promise of God. Our inheritance is heavenly. We obtain that at the rapture, and then God returns his attention to Israel. He puts them through a seven-year fiery trial. They come forth as um, gold, and he establishes that kingdom on the earth for a thousand years. And then Ephesians tells us in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he's going to re reconcile the things that are in heaven. That's us and the body of Christ and the angels who have rebelled and on earth. That's Israel and the nations, and they will be reconciled into one. All right, I hope, I know that this has been a lot of information, uh, but these are things when I understood this, my understanding, my knowledge of the Bible increased exponentially when I began to see these things. And I just want the same thing for you. Everybody can know these things. They're right here. But tradition that is taught in denominationalism blinds people to the truth. Ask God to open your eyes by believing the truth of His Word. That is my encouragement for you today. If you have any questions or comments, please drop those in the comment section below or in the description box. You will see my email. I'll be glad to answer any personal questions that you have. I hope that this has been a blessing to you, and I want to say thank you to Natasha for um, hosting this collaboration. And um, subscribe if you haven't already if you'd like to see more videos like this. Thank you, and God bless you.